Hello and welcome to the Alt Asset Allocation Podcast. Today's interview is with petroleum geologist and energy expert Art Berman. Inflation, higher energy costs, these things pepper the headlines at the moment. And in this episode, we actually go through a chart book. So Art has come prepared with a presentation. I've linked this in the show notes, so altassetallocation.com. And I highly recommend watching this on YouTube to follow along, although I do try to narrate it in the audio-only version. Plus, on YouTube, you get to see me. Hey, that's so great, right? But in this episode, we cover oil and energy, what's going on in the market, some of the biggest factors for demand and supply, really helping you understand understand the oil market and energy market. And ultimately, we cover just the bigger shifts in this energy market overall. Art has a wealth of knowledge on the energy markets, and I love being able to pick his brain on these things. Before we jump into the episode, I wanted to take a quick second to thank you for all the great questions and feedback I've been getting. Before I do these interviews, I tweet out asking for questions, and I've been getting some good ones, even DMs. So Keep those up. You guys rock. I really appreciate it. If you're getting some value, drop me a line as well. I also appreciate that. All right. Art Berman on energy. Enjoy. Art, excited to have you back on the Alt Asset Allocation Podcast. It's been a long time. Welcome back, sir. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back and good to see you, Ben. Likewise. And uh, I was looking back. So it was all the way back at episode 14. And this was published in November 2020, uh, which meant it was probably recorded in July 2020. So nearly two years since we've mm. uh, spoken. And uh, yeah, just a few slightly significant things have happened in the last couple of years. So uh, well overdue for an update here. Well, I'm 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 pleased and honored to be asked back. So hopefully, we'll uh, I'll be able to give your listeners uh, some new perspectives. Yes, indeed. So I mean, you are a petroleum geologist and an energy expert. You are Mister Oil in my mind, and would highly encourage my listeners um, as kind of more of an intro into what is why is the oil in what is impacting the oil market and why like investors should care about it. That that's episode 14. Um, so let's, let's start off just with an overview of the oil market. Cause today this is being recorded on July 13th. And the headline today was U S inflation hits 40 year high in June driven by record gas prices. CPI print was a uh, 9.1%. Mm. Uh, so let's just start off by kind of painting the picture and you sent a terrific slide deck. So I can show that and reference a slide if that would be easier, but we'll definitely get into that one um, further on. Yeah, well, so I guess the, 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 the main thing that I would like people to understand, and there, there is a slide that, that shows this uh, as clearly as can be, and, and that is that, um, you know, in inflation, the main, the main cause of it, uh, the main factor for inflation in the U.S., uh, I think it's slide number one, uh, Ben. Yeah, there you go. It's oil price, and it, it, it it's astonishing to me as I listen to all these really smart economists and analysts talk about all the you know all the the many reasons for inflation that that very few of them um, ever really mention oil, uh, and if they do, it's kind of parenthetically. Uh, of course, energy is left out of core inflation, which gives you some idea of you know, sort of how well, just how bizarre everything is. But th this this chart goes from January of 15, 2015 uh, through June of 2022. And, uh, you know, I don't want to insult anybody by uh, trying to help them see the obvious correlation. This is West Texas intermediate U.S. oil price and U.S. inflation. And, I mean, you know, it's it's about as good a correlation as you get in the real world. And so this shows today's um, inflation print of 9.1%, and it shows um, June's oil price of almost $115. So uh, in my world, and it's not because I'm partisan, I, you know, I, I, I look at all commodities, 
um, if you had to choose one factor that controls inflation, it's oil price. It's just that simple. Um, and, and so why would that be the case? Well, because, I mean, the economy runs on energy. I mean, you, I mean we have to work um, to make money. And most of our work comes from energy, which in the modern world, most of it is oil. And so when the price of oil or energy goes up, then the cost of doing business goes up and that gets passed along all through the economy. So uh, the fact that there is such a beautiful correlation uh, comes as no surprise to me, but I think it maybe is a little bit of maybe not a surprise, but a little bit of a revelation when I make a statement as strong as high oil price is the leading cause of inflation. Um, there are people that will argue with me about that, and I'm going to stand my ground. Um, you know, look at this chart and tell me where I'm wrong. <laughs> That's all I can say. Yeah. Well, what are the what are the arguments here that it's actually money printing, and this is actually what happens after money printing is everything goes up, including oil? Is that the main argument that kind of people people are saying? That's certainly one of them, and and so. I turn that around and say, well, what is money? You know, you want to make an argument that it's not oil or energy, um, that it's money. Tell me what money is. And after a certain amount of, you know, uh, deer in the headlight kind of things, that's not a question that people often ask. Um, I often have to say, well, look, I mean, money is a claim on energy. It's just that simple. Uh, if we go back to, you know, ancient times, uh, you know, pre-industrial, uh, sometime after the agricultural revolution in you know, 10,000, 11,000, 12,000 years ago, um, that was the first time that humans accumulated a surplus. Okay, when 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 we were uh, hunter gatherers, when we got hungry, we went out and killed something. You know, we all went out and you know, killed a mastodon or whatever. And uh, we had enough food for, you know, a couple of weeks, just sort of like our, you know, our, our, our predator friends on the Savannah do right now. They go out and they get a kill and it feeds them for a couple of days or a week and they lay around and, you know, nurse their cubs or play around with their friends until they have to work again. Okay. Well, suddenly with agriculture, um, we had, some people were able to accumulate a surplus because they could store grain, which they really couldn't do at the time with meat. And so some people had enough surplus that they could say, well, you know, there's some work I need to do. Um, I need to dig a ditch. Uh, hey, Ben, um, how about if you dig this ditch for me, because I don't feel like doing it, and I'll give you uh, a bushel of wheat in exchange for your work. Okay, calories for calories, jewels for jewels. Okay, think about it however you want. And you might say, screw you, or sure, why not? And you do the work and you take your bushel of wheat home and you know you and your family can make bread or do whatever you like. Well, that, that's pretty awkward after a while. And so eventually, rather than exchange the wheat for the work, we invent a, a, a coin. And the coin is good for a bushel of wheat. And it's a whole lot easier. You put it in your pocket instead of having to, you know, carry it on your back. And eventually money became the exchange that humans used. But it was just a claim. It was a token. It, it, it represented work. It represented calories or jewels. Now, in today's world, we forget about all of that. But, that's it, but it hasn't changed. And so when we print money, if that's really the right word for things, and you know more about this than I do, but money is a claim on work, and debt is a lien on future energy. It's just that simple. And so when you print a lot of money that you don't have any, any material basis for, then the assumption is that, I mean, money is a debt, right? I mean, that, that's what it is today, because there's no gold backing it up. And so the assumption is you're going to, you're going to pay that, 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 that debt by production of future energy, okay? And if you can do it, that's good. And if you can't, then we're all in trouble. 
And, and so to me, it's, you know, it seems intuitive that, that that's the way it works. But I understand it's easy to forget. It's easy to think that money has a life of its own, but it doesn't. Nothing has a life of its own. Everything relates to something. And we're not stupid. I mean, you know, we, we don't work so that we can have a stack of bills. We have to be able to do something. With that. So that's the argument. It's, it's, it's really quite simple and as basic as it gets. Yeah, and that's, that's helpful to go back to the basics because I think you, you do kind of get a little bit confused with us as humans when all of the intricacies of, of how money is in the system. So going back to the basics like that and, you know, for the record, terrific d- ditch digger, this guy. So, you know, happy, happy for, uh, well, if, uh, if we slip into a, a full on depression, you know, maybe I'll, I'll go back to digging ditches a little bit more often. <laughs> but, uh, hope not. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's kind of a workout and stuff now. Um, so since we chatted, like Ukraine, um, uh, Russia, U.S. boycott on Russian oil, I mean, you talk about a lot about supply and demand. Um, this has significantly changed the supply, the dynamic of supply and demand within the market. So let's let's talk about um, supply and kind of some of the kind of some of the big changes. And again. Uh, for for my listeners um, on podcast, if you check this out on YouTube, we're likely going through a slide deck um, that Art has shared, and I'll have this in the show notes as well that you can um, flip through as well. Well, what's going on in Ukraine is a uh, is a fundamental restructuring of uh, the world order of power. I mean, again, I'm, I'm I don't I don't prepare these comments, you know, for shock value or anything. That, that's just, you know, we've just covered two big ticket items, inflation and uh, and what's going on in Ukraine. And, and so um, I'm, I'm certainly uh, my, my first degree was in history. So I know a little bit about these things, but I, I'm, I'm not a political scientist. But what, what's happening in Ukraine is so much more than Ukraine. Um, I mean, Ukraine has, has kind of been the focal point of all kinds of stuff in our lives for many years, uh, not the least of which was, you know, all the impeachment issues with, with Trump. I mean, those kind of centered on Ukraine and Biden's son has stuff going on in Ukraine. And there's a reason for that, okay? And so Ukraine is a, is a, is a huge transit point for mostly natural gas coming out of out of Russia into Europe. Now, that has changed um, somewhat in the last few years because Russia doesn't want to be that dependent on Ukraine. But nonetheless, Ukraine is an energy crossroads. And, and Ukraine is a place where, where NATO, Western interests clash with Russian, therefore Eastern interests. And an awful lot of nations which are semi-unaligned, like India, Turkey, I mean, Turkey's a member of NATO, but um, they could kind of go either way. Uh, China's certainly uh, aligned, but they're, they're not aligned with NATO. You know, these are countries that are saying, well, you know, we don't really agree with you. We don't, we don't think that we really want to sanction Russia. Uh, in fact, we... We kind of like the deal that's going on right now because we can buy Russian oil real cheap. So, you know, this is a restructuring of, of the way that the, that the world apportions its energy. And with what I said before about how energy is the economy, that, that's kind of a significant thing. And, and so without getting into the details, which I don't care to because it's a distraction, uh, you know, let, let's just leave it there. Uh, I think you know and your your listeners know that Ukraine uh, does a lot of other things, like uh, produces a huge amount of food in the form of grain and uh, all sorts of uh, you know of other significant commodities for the world. It's you know it's not a I mean it's a significant provider of of, of a lot of things to the world and a transit point for those. So 
the war is is complicating supply chains in ways that you know we thought we were a little bit out of that that bind and, and here we find ourselves again so it's it's a mess but let me conclude my comments on ukraine with a little known fact that i think is super important and that is uh, believe it or not, and you can believe it, um, Vladimir Putin has a PhD, and his PhD is in mineral economics, and he wrote his dissertation on the fact that the Russian, the Soviet Union fell because it failed to manage its oil and gas assets correctly. Okay, so whether and, and or this not... Is, this is mind-blowing for those of you that don't understand that, uh, like... This is a very uh, smart guy. And there's there's theories about somebody ghostwriting or whatever, but like he probably very under very much understands these things. So he's not he's not off his rocker with these decisions, probably. Um, no. And 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 I and I wish he were, you know, from a from a partisan perspective as an American. But and and you're right. I mean, there are rumors that, you know, well, maybe he didn't write the thesis himself, but Nonetheless, I would argue that, you know, discount it any way you like. This man knows more about energy than all of the leaders of NATO countries put together. Because, and, and I don't mean this is going to sound bad, but um, I mean, they're, they're, they're ignorant of energy. It, it, energy is too complex. It doesn't lend itself to, a, you know, to three or four talking points. And, and Putin understands. And he knows, he knows that for all the talk and the kabuki dancing and, you know, all of the mime shows that are going on, that Europe is screwed without oil and gas from Russia and that he's playing, as Russians always do, the long game. And they have absolutely no chance of winning the long game. The longer he... he drags out this thing in Ukraine, whether you think he's winning or losing, it doesn't really matter. He is winning. He's winning because he wants to extract pain from the West. And he's doing it. I, just this, this morning, um, the German government is running models on how they can switch from gas to wood this winter. I mean, this is real. I mean, this is an official communique from the German government. Okay, so, I mean, you know, this is a huge step backward in time. And, and so this is the kind of thing, Putin knows what he's doing. He knows, I mean, you know, again, I'm not endorsing him. I'm not admiring him. I'm just saying he knows what he's doing. And Absolutely. what he's doing, aside from demonstrating how how much everybody depends on Russia, he's showing, you know, this renewable energy thing, it just isn't working. I mean, not that it can't work, not that uh, it, it's a bad idea, but, you know, I, I don't hear anything hardly about people, uh, you know, uh, making a run on solar panels in Germany. I mean, they're talking about burning wood this winter for crying out loud. Okay, when push comes to shove, uh, we got to stay warm and we have to live. And, you know, your solar panels are real nice and the wind turbines are great, but uh, we'll, we'll talk again in a couple of years. I mean, and, 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 and you know, Ben, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm an environmentalist. I'm a conservationist. Uh, I'm deeply concerned about climate change. Um, I, 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 I'm very concerned about the state of, the, of Earth's ecosystem. Uh, but this is the maximum power principle at work and humans are gonna like all life we're gonna maximum we're gonna go for the maximum bang that we can get for our energy buck because that's the way it works and it ain't solar it ain't wind not today not this decade not next maybe sometime so that's that's the realignment those are, that's the scope of the realignment that's going on in the world right what, what's what's the end game here for Europe? So, so I mean, Europe is very reliant on Russia for their oil. It's, it's July now, so it's less of a concern. But this winter, 
is, you know, temperatures start dropping not that far away from now uh, in the next four or five months. So what what is kind of their end game? They roll over and reduce the sanctions. What what has to happen here? Or um, burn down all the forests, on, I, I guess. <laughs> well, <laughs> we did that once back in the 14th century, and that's kind of when coal became a thing. Um, yeah, with the population that we have in the world today, the forests are not going to last very long. And, and you know, we didn't talk about fertilizer either. I mean, this is another very important thing that both Russia and, and Ukraine provide to the world. And by the way, Ukraine has lots and lots of natural gas. And um, how do we make fertilizer? Well, we make it from natural gas. Um, in fact, if you look at the, uh, you know, like what are the, the five or so really significant technological breakthroughs that led to the 20th century, fertilizer is on Vaslav Schmiel's list, okay? And because the, the population of the earth is, is, is limited by its ability to feed a population. And as of the end of World War I, the population of planet Earth was less than 2 billion. And it was less than 2 billion because that's about all that Earth could feed. And these two German scientists, Haber and Bosch, figured out just before the war how to liquefy air, which is the only source of abundant free nitrogen on planet Earth. Um, and with nitrogen, you can make as much fertilizer as you want. And you need two things, hydrogen and nitrogen. You get the hydrogen from natural gas. You get the nitrogen from air and kaboom, we've got 8 billion people because we can feed them. So when fertilizer starts becoming a problem, either because it's too expensive or because there's not enough of it, suddenly people starve. When there isn't enough grain to distribute because of a conflict in Ukraine, more people starve. And so, I mean, these are just, these are just the harsh facts. Um, and again, I, I just, you know, to me, it's obvious that all these things are related, but I, I don't think that this, well, not I don't think, I mean, this, this is simply not uh, part of the, uh, of the perspective that you get from, you know, watching cable TV, um, and, and nor, nor should it be, perhaps. I mean, I'm not criticizing them. I'm just saying, you know, to, to those of us that work in the energy business, it's all related. Yeah, and for the average person, it's it's just they see home price or they see gas prices going up substantially. They see uh, these CPI prints that are out of control. You know, it's unclear where these things are coming from, and and then you know if we have uh, food shortages and things, it will all kind of come cir full circle. But what other, like what other? So I mean, this Russia Ukraine thing is going to have tons of impacts, not only to oil, but what other like exogenous supply factors should should we be thinking about in the world today? I mean, Russia was the second largest ex exporter of crude after Saudi Arabia. So, I mean, the, Actually, this is the, right. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. the big three, US, Russia, and, and Saudi Arabia, and everyone thought, well, with all these horrible sanctions, uh, we need to try to you know, recalculate supply and demand because, I mean, Russian supply is going to go to who knows. But, uh, you know, at one point, some of us were thinking eh, it, could, I mean, it, it could be down four or five million barrels a day from the 10 or so that it ordinarily is. And if the world is suddenly short, let's say, four or five million barrels a day, I mean, that's, that's an absolute catastrophe. And we haven't seen anything like that since the Iran-Iraq war in 1980. Uh, that didn't come to pass uh, because, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, there were other customers that were willing to buy Russian oil at a discount, China, India being two important ones. So Russian exports are actually only down about a million and a half barrels a day, which is enough. I mean, don't get me wrong. That's a lot. But it's not anywhere near what most people expected. Um, with gas, um, you know, there's all the, there are all kinds of curious things. Russia has cut off a couple of countries from gas. And right now, the, one of the big pipelines, uh, the Nord Stream, that goes under the Baltic, 
supposedly has a, a compressor that doesn't work. Okay. Um, maybe that's true, maybe that's not. Uh, but it can easily be interpreted as Putin turning the screws on Germany. And Canada says, oh, well, you know, we've got a spare. Um, you know, how about if we send you one? And uh, Gazprom, which is Russia's big gas company, says, yeah, we, we can't really think of a way that that would work. That was as of today or yesterday. So, you know, the, this is a, a continuation of what the Brits used to call the, you know, the great game. It, it's the great game of, of, of East and West. And uh, it's playing out just as if, you know, the, I mean, the, the players are different, some of them, but Russia is still one. And so much of, of, of England's foreign policy when they were the top country in the world was directed at Russia. I mean, they, they, they went into Afghanistan to control Russia because they wanted to keep their supply lines to India open. Uh, they they invaded Russia from the south a couple of times. Uh, you know this is a, this is there's a long history to to all of this stuff, and uh, Russia seems to be a constant in most of it. Kind of interesting. Very interesting, and and fits into the, like this broader picture of deglobalization um, and undoing a lot of what's been happening over the past couple decades. But. Right. Um, yeah, I think we could we could go down a very uh, dark path uh, on this one. To to avoid that, I'll I'll, I'll pull us back and talk um, about so 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 clearly some massive changes supply. Uh, there's a, like a bigger chess game that's going on, and and oil is a key part of this, or in, and has been since oil's been significant part of the economy. But um, in terms of demand, I, I want to jump back to your flip mm -hmm. book. So in your presentation, you have a lot of slides um, really covering demand. And I think, I think this is what a lot of um, analysts and, and people end up talking about quite a bit is, you know, gasoline's impact uh, and on oil prices and in general. So um, yeah, I'll just kind of have you direct me, but you've got some fantastic slides in here. So wherever you want to start um, regarding this, this, demand. This is fine. So, so this is um, US oil, WTI futures price as of today, 96.30 was its, its closing price today. And this goes back to the beginning of, of, uh, of this year. And so what I'm showing here is just price, futures price in blue, and then the shaded area is, you know, some of your people know about Bollinger Bands. This is simply two standard deviations around the 20-day moving average, which is the dashed line. And so if you, if you believe, or I mean, it's not a belief thing, it's empirical, that, that, that prices rarely get outside of these bands. And part of that's because they change every day since it moves forward. But you know, at 96.30, we're a little bit more than two standard deviations below the mean. Um, and that tells me that we're probably not going to go much lower. And in fact, it went up a little bit today from yesterday. Similarly, you know, if you go up and look at, uh, you know, June 8th, uh, we got a little bit above and uh, lo and behold, things fell. We got a little bit below, lo and behold, things went up. So, you know, I mean, oil price is not like some sort of, uh, you know, magical roulette wheel. I mean, there is a thing called price formation, which believe it or not, I mean, I can't tell you what the price of oil is going to be today or next week. I don't think anybody can, but it does follow some rules. And so, you know, the, the great likelihood when people say, oh, oil is going to $50, I say, oh, really? That's interesting. <laughs> you know, that would be about five standard deviations below the mean. I'm not saying it couldn't happen. But it certainly isn't going to happen overnight. So, I mean, that, that, that's kind of one perspective. So, as, as, as most people know, uh, you know, nearly half of every barrel of oil is turned into gasoline. So, let's, let's take a look at the next slide. For my listeners, we're on slide six. Yeah, there you go. So, what I'm showing here, this is actually a, an incremental graph. Um, and, and so, what, I'm, what the point is here is that, if, if you read the paper, if you listen to cable news or, you know, Bloomberg or whatever, um, everybody says, oh, everything's going great. You know, the economy's, uh, 
back on track and oil consumption is going through the roof. Well, not so much. Um, if you look at gasoline, which is in blue, and this big gap in the middle is, of course, 2020 in the COVID um, period. Which and, is and just which, nuts. I mean, that's talk about the collapse of demand. It's it, oh, <laughs> crazy. We, the world we've stopped. We've never seen anything like it in, in modern history. Um, and by modern, I mean, you know, like the last two centuries since we've been. This is when things like Bollinger Bands fail, right? No, no amount of technical analysis could ever <laughs> forecast something like this. Well, you can't forecast. It. That's that's a fact. But the point is, is that you know, gasoline consumption in the United States has not recovered to the levels that it was before 2020 nor has diesel, nor has jet. Okay, these are, these are transport fuels. These are what make our economy run. Okay, and so if you look at total consumption, total consumption is more or less back to normal. But total consumption includes a lot of fluff that is not, that the main job of it is not to run the economy. So so when people say, well, you know, demand is just great. It's going, you know, it, no, it, it's actually not. It's not terrible either, but, but it has not recovered. And I would be surprised if it does recover. So we're looking at half a million barrels of gasoline use that disappeared since COVID. Okay. But so is, that, this, it, is this uh, partly, I mean, there's a, that there's a bunch of factors, obviously, in this. Uh, one that comes to mind is electrification of the, the, the vehicle fleet, um, sure. I would think, uh, as well as some actual changes structurally of, you know, of people traveling for work and things like that. Sure. But what, what are kind of the biggest factors in kind of well, the let's, let's Let's move to the next slide. This is good, uh, just, just for the heck of it. So, I mean, this actually shows, these are annual averages. And so you can see that gasoline, which is the green, is substantially less than it was over the last several years before COVID. In fact, everything is less except for the red. Those are hydrocarbon gas liquids. Those are things like ethane, propane, butane. Those are things that don't actually come from oil. And they come from natural gas. And so you add all this up and you include those gas liquids and everything looks great. Okay. But, but the fact is, is that the, the, the composition the makeup of, of what's called oil has fundamentally changed. And we're now much more focused. What's ethane used for? Ethane is the biggest single component of these gas liquids. It's used to make plastic. Okay. When, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you put some food in the baggie, that baggie's made of ethane, okay? <laughs> um, you know, butane and, 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 and you know, propane and, and all that other stuff. Some of those are actually fuels of sorts, but most of that increase is for plastics. Let's go on to the next slide here. Yeah. Or so, if you're out in California, you know, the propane heaters, because everybody's eating outside, that the, bumped it up just a, ever so slightly, probably. <laughs> just a bit, yeah. But here, this is, this is U.S. vehicle miles travel, okay? This is irrespective of, you know, of electric cars, hybrid cars, gasoline cars. This is the whole shop. And what you see is that we are driving less after COVID. You mentioned that. Um, I've got a chart that I didn't include that goes all the way back to 2000. And what we find is that we've been driving less since about 2006. Um, so Americans are driving less. There are many reasons we can discuss, but it's a fact. Let's go on to the next. Well, and I, I would think that this trend continues with work from home and, and, and a number of other things. But, uh, but it was happening general. long before work from home. Yeah. So you mentioned electric cars. And I'm going to say, uh-uh, not a fact. This shows the uh, starting in 2021, uh, the, the composition of the US car fleet, all right? And so blue are conventional internal combustion cars. The red are other alternative like hybrid and plug-in and you know, all kinds of stuff. 
and then the yellow is electric. So as of 2021, only 1% of the vehicle fleet was electric. So a rounding error to zero. Not enough electric cars to make a difference. And, and, and the forecast here, this comes from the U.S. Department of Energy. It's a forecast. It's wrong. But it's notionally, it's notionally correct, directionally correct. And so um, this data says that by 2050, electric cars may represent 9% of the U.S. car fleet. That's so insignificant still on such a long time frame. This blows me away. So 1% of number of cars in the U S is represented by you electronic electric cars. That's correct. I mean, it it, is this, is the number of cars inflated somehow by transport, which is tough to replace by electric or. No, this is it. That's so low. I've, I've, I've made a version of this chart every year for the last five years, I don't generate the data. I mean, yeah. I just bought well, it. I mean, it's just a rounding error. <laughs> I mean, it's well, crazy. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, this is, uh, this is, and, and there'll be people who say, oh, that, that can't be right. That's clearly wrong. And I say, fine, I know it's wrong. Double it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Triple Four exit. It. It's still <laughs> like very it, it's slow. Still, you know, it, it, it's not going to change the world. It may change the world a little bit, mm. and that's fine. But, you know, we're, I mean, the, the, the focus of our discussion, Ben, is energy crisis, okay? Mm. <laughs> we're not yeah. going to solve a crisis with electric cars, okay? We're not going to mm. solve a crisis with wind turbines and solar panels. We're in a crisis, okay? Uh, I, I don't know what the next slide is, but go to it. Well, yeah, this is cool. The, the other reason that people will cite for driving less is efficiency, fuel efficiency, you know, cafe standards and all of that, to which I say nonsense. Again, not because I want to say it, because this is data. This is data from, you know, the, the U.S. EPA. And what we see, we see three things. We see the blue is fuel efficiency measured in miles per gallon on the left. The red is gasoline price, and that's normalized or, you know, deflated to $20, $21. And then there's the fuel efficiency change, which is in gray, just the, you know, the annual change in fuel efficiency. And what you see is there was a huge improvement in fuel efficiency on the left side of the graph, starting in 1975 up until about 1987. Okay, that's when we had the first oil shocks. And price of gas got real expensive. And guess what? Uh, Consumers told car makers, we want better gas mileage. It was easy to do that. Because all you had to do was take a, you know, a four ton car and, and shave off a bunch of steel and replace it with plastic and aluminum. And you could reduce the weight of the car by 30 or 40 percent and improve gas mileage. And so that big efficiency gain that you see on the left side of the graph was just that. It was just lightening up the vehicles. Then we went through a long period where efficiency actually decreased. That's because oil price went down. People didn't care anymore about Mm -hmm. fuel efficiency. And then beginning in about 2004 or five, when oil prices, gasoline prices started going up, we had an improvement, but not nearly as dramatic as what we saw in the 1970s. And the reason was the low hanging fruit had already been picked, okay? We'd already reduced the weight of the vehicle. So how, how were these efficiency changes achieved? They were achieved through uh, aerodynamics, but mostly through figuring out ways of recycling waste heat, all right? Your car engine gets hot, you know, you know that. <laughs> and so they, they, they Engineers figured out ways of reusing that heat as energy, okay? But now we look at where we are today, and over the last five years, we're flat. There have been, there's been no improvement in fuel efficiency, despite the ups and downs in gasoline price. And I would argue that efficiency or technology, despite the popular notion, is not a continual process. It's a, it's a stepwise process where some new 
advance takes place. It makes a big difference until everybody uses it, and then it goes away. And we reset to the same slope we were on before at a higher level. And so I would argue, not because I'm a pessimist, but just because I understand how, how the second law of thermodynamics works, is we're playing the game of diminishing returns here. Um, that will there be, can there be in, uh, additional increases in fuel efficiency? Of course they, there can, and there will be, but they're not going to be as great as they were in the early 2000s, and which were not nearly as great as they were in the 1970s, because there are limits to how much you can improve this efficiency. So again, I don't want to you know, rain on anybody's uh, you know, faith-based belief in, in the fact that technology will always save us, but um, technology does not create energy. And, and, and that's, that's a fact. Um, so, so these are, you know, these are kind of the, the, the hard limits to, to the, the bigger problem that we're talking about here. The, the takeaways here and all of this kind of fits into this energy crisis is that uh, uh, we're not using any less, less gasoline significantly, certainly not by fuel efficiency or electric cars. And we're not really driving that much less. Maybe it's, it's structurally a little bit different, but I want to I want to jump into um, I think this this slide twelve probably is the next good one to jump into. Um, we consume energy; the world runs on energy. You say it all the time, but I think that this this chart shows it quite well. Yeah. So this chart shows all of the forms of energy, from biomass all the way to wind and solar, from the year eighteen hundred. I mean, this, is, this is some pretty cool stuff. <laughs> Obviously, our confidence uh, diminishes it's, it's a bit. It's directionally accurate, I bet. <laughs> no, it, it, I think it's quite directionally accurate. And certainly, the last hundred years is, is quite accurate. But what we see is that per capita energy consumption, which is black, increases stepwise, just as I've been talking about. And, and whenever per capita energy consumption increases, the economy grows, as does the general prosperity of, of individuals. And, and you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to try to explain why that's the case, but it's simply a matter of productivity, that if, if I can produce more work with the same amount of effort by using uh, a more efficient fuel like oil instead of coal, then it's a win. It's a win for, for, for everybody because we get more work from the same number of people. And so what we see is that uh, when we look at the, the first words on there, coal, 1830 to 1940, we saw a, 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 a gradual increase and then a fairly sharp increase in the 20, early part of the 20th century as more and more of the world started using coal. Then we got to a flat spot, 1925 to 40. And you can argue that some of that was the depression, and, and I would agree with you. But then oil comes into the picture. That's the green. And look at what happens. Look at that, that incredible increase in, in world energy consumption. I mean, it is a rocket ship because oil is so much more productive. It has so much, it's so much more energy dense than coal and wood. And that's where the world economy, that's where we got this whole notion of progress, that it lifted so much of the world out of subsistence and into prosperity. And then, kaboom, we hit a ceiling in 1974 to 2000. What was that? High oil prices. That's when we had the, you know, the Yom Kippur War, the Iran-Iraq War. That's when oil prices went crazy. And what's the result? People started consuming less. That's what we do. We adjust. All right. Then we get into natural gas. Gas 2000 to 2008. Fit into the next piece of the pie. That was a huge jump, but it was brief. It was kind of stillborn. It was just as steep, if not steeper, than oil because there's a ton of gas in the world and it's really cheap. Well, what happened? Well, 
the financial crisis happened in 2008, and then investors said, no, 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 we don't want any more of this fossil fuel. We want wind and solar, which is absolutely uh, a step backward in terms of energy content and productivity. Again, you know, no bias here. I'm, I'm all for them. You just can't, you, know, you, you can't make them more than they are. And so we've been on a flat spot relatively in terms of energy consumption since 2008. And it's hard to grow the world's economy when you're not increasing your productivity. So another way to think about all this is, is the world uses, you know, something like, you know, a hundred million, uh, you know, or, the world uses, we use 100 million barrels of, of, of oil a day. And in terms of all the fossil fuels we use, I mean, it's, you know, it, it's even more. And, and, and so if a barrel of oil contains about 10 or 11 years worth of work, which it does, and, and you can discount that back for, you know, the number of days of the week and all that. And let's just say it's, it's four and a half or five. You, you multiply that by the number of, of barrels of oil equivalent of all this. And we have a system of slavery in the world where we have 8 billion people who have 500 billion fossil energy slaves working for us all the time. I mean, that's the math that, that it works out to be. And so you want to know why the world is so productive? You want to know why we got rid of human slavery? Because we got a better form of slavery, and it's called fossil energy. And, and, and for people who think that we can just turn that off and still have growth in our economy, let's go to the next slide. Yeah, and this one really uh, hammers it home. So we're on this slide is, 13. This is an absolute depressing slide. It's terrible. <laughs> this shows um, all of the different forms of energy, but I've lumped them here. And so we've got non-fossil and green, coal, oil, and gas, and I'm showing population, world population in black. And you see the, the, the yellow line at the bottom, that's renewable, that little bitty blip at the bottom. And so without you know, trying to take this thing too literally, if the world were to rely solely on non-fossil, which includes hydroelectric, nuclear, biomass, you know, all that kind of stuff, in addition to, you know, to renewables, we could only support about 2 billion people today on that energy. And so, but we got almost 8 billion. So let's just be super optimistic and say, well, it's going to grow. I mean, we're going to grow that. And we are. Let's triple it. You triple it. And that says that you can support 6 billion people on non-fossil energy. Well, the UN estimates that we're going to have about 10 billion people in 2050. So to put this in a really dark perspective, um, 4 billion people have to die so that we can have the world run on clean energy. And, you know, it could be a whole lot more than that because that assumes that, you know, that, that everybody just peacefully dies and and, and we don't have wars and we don't have massive immigration and all that kind of stuff. But this, I mean, you want to talk about a crisis. Likely the, uh, this case. is a real scary crisis that all of these people that are, you know, beating the table about, oh, we got to get off of fossil fuel and it's killing us. Well, I agree it is. And, and, and this will also kill us. So um, gosh, you know, people then look at me and saying, Art, you're so depressing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we're damned if we do, we're damned if we don't. Well, um, my, my role here is, you know, I'm a scientist and, and, and I want people to understand what it is that we're trying to navigate. And I'm not here to, you know, to, to, to fill you full of, you know, of, of sweet nothings and you know, paint a rosy picture or a negative picture. But if you don't know what's going, what's out there, then you can't possibly prosper, can you? 
Well, and so, you look at the data, right? And it's like the 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 narrative uh, that you're hearing uh, isn't quite supported by the data, and in this slide, really, really hits it home. Um, and it's tough not to end with like uh, pitchforks and torches with this stuff. <laughs> um, so, but like, so this is this is it's tough to be bearish oil oil at usage within the economy within the world. Um, but I want to I want to ask you what is the most credible like bear case for oil? We've looked at the data. All of these charts kind of support this energy crisis, oil's not going away, but like there's got to be some credible bearish uh, take on all of this. Uh, what is it and why? Yeah, so humans, um, we, don't, we don't change our behavior very much except in, in situations of trauma. Okay, crisis is what causes us to change our behavior, and it's usually crisis that that causes people to be really good to each other too. When 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 things get totally scary, and like you know all of our lives are on the line, that seems like when I'm willing to risk my life for yours. As long as things are relatively comfortable and I can make a few extra bucks at your expense, well, I'm going to screw you. <laughs> but we get really we get we get strangely altruistic when we when when we're leveled and we see ourselves as as sharing in a common survival problem and and so the, you know everybody's going to ask me well yeah art but i mean what's the answer and the answer is pretty simple the answer is use less energy it's real simple i say it's simple I, but I, I thought we're you were going to go real dark, like if, just be less people at the world. <laughs> it's like, well, well no, that, art, you got even it, darker. <laughs> well, it, it goes there, but it has to start somewhere, okay? And, 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 and where it starts is that we have to be shocked into a recognition that we can't go on consuming the amount of energy that we are now. Now, there's somebody, probably a, a great deal of somebody, out there right now listening to this and saying, oh, well, you know, you're coming at it from an oil and gas perspective and you're biased. And, you know, despite what you've shown me, um, you know, renewables are after all the answer. Well, I wish that were true. But the problem with that is that is that if, if we continue to consume the same amount of energy roughly that we are now, it really doesn't matter if it's fossil-based or non-fossil-based, that by the time you get done doing all the, the energy accounting for the mining and the, the transportation and the manufacturing and the distribution, you end, up, you end up making the earth unlivable for most of its ecosystem, no matter how you do it. Is it, is it, is it better if, if you use less fossil energy? Slightly, somewhat. You know, is it is it 50 percent better? No way. Is it 10 percent? Optimistically, it could be. It could be, except we're not ready to make it 10 percent, not even close. And so the first thing I would like people to consider. Is it's not whether we use energy type A or energy type B. If our goal is to continue living at this crazy level of, of, of standard that we have where everybody can afford a 5,000 square foot house or think they can, we're, we're screwed, okay? I mean, that's got to stop. And it isn't going to stop by choice. It's going gonna, it's gonna to stop by, by necessity. But we cannot prosper as a species if our ecosystem is wrecked. And it's wrecked right now. I mean, the number of species that are becoming extinct because of human activity. And I'm not even talking about climate change. I don't want to get into that can of worms, okay? Let's just talk. I mean, you, you can't dispute the, the species extinction. You cannot dispute the acidification of the ocean. You cannot dispute the amount of crap, the plastic, and all this garbage that's in the ocean. You can't do it. I mean, it's just, it's just a fact. 
And all of that is to support growth of, of our species. Okay, so at some point, you know, we have to learn to live within the, the context and, and, and rules of the global ecosystem. And the first way to do that is to learn to consume less. And the, the, the silver lining, if there is one, in this horrible thing that Vladimir Putin is doing, and by the way, it's not just him. I mean, Russia is big. They, they think it's great. I mean, most Russians do. Um, but I don't want to get into the culture piece of that. That kind of thing, COVID, things like that, 2008 financial crisis, those bring us closer to having to honestly, ruthlessly assess our situation on planet Earth. So I'm not welcoming it. I know it's uncomfortable, but it's a whole lot less uncomfortable to be become aware of it now rather than, oh, God, a billion people just died kind of thing. Um, so I, I'm not preaching hope, but I'm not preaching, I'm not preaching doom either. But we have to start somewhere, and we start with awareness. And once, once some of us have a common awareness, and we can, we can call nonsense on a lot of the proposals that we see out there, you know, like uh, the Green New Deal. And again, this is purely non-political, okay? The Green New De Deal is energy, it, it, it's, it's made by energy morons, okay? It, it's concocted by people who either don't understand energy or are so cynical that they're just promoting it, you know, to, to, to move their own careers forward. It, it, it's a non-starter. It doesn't work. Net zero by 2050 is an, is an absolute impossibility. It just, it just cannot possibly be. And these are not art's opinions. The, I mean, this is physics. This is just basic physics. You cannot do what is impossible to do. And you certainly can't do it in the time frame that, that people are talking about. So some way or another, people have to learn enough to say, wait a minute. No, that's not, that, that, that can't work. That is not how we're going to get here. You know, we got people, you know, all these extinction uh, people. Oh, well, you know, we have to get our fossil fuel tomorrow. Well, okay, you know, let's try that one. Out. No, we can't do that. You know, I wish we could, but we can't. So we have, to, we, have to, we have to have, you know, some sense of what is feasible. How can we minimize the suffering and the decrease in population? How can we do this in a way that doesn't cause the kind of catastrophes that it will cause if we don't do anything? And again, I'm not, I'm not talking about climate change. Climate change is a subset. Climate change is a part of, of abusing the ecosystem. So I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic because you're helping more people at least hear a perspective that maybe is new to them. Hmm. And, 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 you know, some percentage of those who hear it will dismiss it and say, well, he's, he's a crackpot, you know, and, we don't like him. And, you know, he was wrong about something 20 years ago. So probably he's wrong about this too. And okay, fine. But, but, you know, some people will hear it and, and, and will remember, you know, that, that we actually do have a problem and, and, and that's how we begin. But we certainly cannot, we cannot chart a path forward until there's a certain core group of people that, that, that say, yeah, okay, we don't need to thrash this out anymore. We get it. Yeah. And I, I want to leave my listeners. So, I mean, education awareness on this is, is obviously the most important thing. And hopefully this, this talk um, and all that you do helps with that. But is there any, um, and perhaps being involved more politically with some of these decisions and, and, and voting on, on things that make actual sense, but are there any changes that like the average listener could do at home, a, a small increase, but like make any difference in energy consumption for them as a household? Well, there are, and, and, and there, but, but, I, you know, I don't want to distract. I, I don't, I mean, let's just say that, you know, if, if you don't want to use plastic straws, then you shouldn't. 
but it, you know, it's a rounding error to zero. Um, most of the things that I could talk about right now um, are, are, are wise and appropriate, but um, they, they don't make a difference until, until enough people say enough, you know, enough of the bungling of, uh, of energy policy uh, and demand that, you know, that, that we, we at least talk about a, a different direction. But my advice to people is open your eyes, understand what's out there, and think about, you know, what's really important to you. What, you know, if, if, if your happiness is dependent upon uh, continuing to earn more money, then I promise you, uh, you will be an unhappy person in the future because the world is going to get poorer. And, it, you know, it's... It's inevitable. I mean, you you cannot continue to grow at the rate that that we have. It's it's just not possible. It's like fuel efficiency. You know, it's a diminishing returns kind of thing. And so, you know, could we imagine? I mean, you know, I'm I'm seventy some odd years old. Um, you know, when I was twenty years old, I mean, no, almost nobody had houses that had more than two bedrooms in them. You know, life was pretty good. I mean, you know. Would it be so awful to go back to living standards of, you know, 1970 United States? Um, it, it would be a big step down from where we are now. But no, we, we did just fine. We did great, you know. Um, and, and so, you know, when you when you think about it that way, it's not nearly as, as radical. Um, it's, you know, it, it, it's a. Uh, it, it, if, if, you, if you break it into pieces, it makes sense. But, but we have to be willing to, to learn how to be satisfied with, with less. And that means more of the people that we enjoy, the things that we like to do that don't necessarily cost a lot of money and therefore use a lot of energy. And, and, and some people say, well, that's, that's bogus. You know, that's shallow. Um, well, I wish I had a, I wish I had a more substantial answer to give you, but that's what I do in my life. What I do in my life is try to figure out how can I be happy in this moment without having to constantly figure out how to make more money and use more energy. And it seems like to it. work for me. Yeah. No. I, yeah, well, and people, people don't go for a backpacking trip uh, through the mountains and you realize how, how little you need <laughs> to, to truly be happy and like subside on life. Uh, but yeah, Art, is, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. I mean, albeit a little dark, but uh, you know, it's tend to, these things tend to get dark if you start thinking critically about like the path that we're on. And if, if we continue at the trajectory we are, it certainly isn't like a great scenario. So um, these are, these are great wake up calls for my listeners and a really good deep dive on um, the oil market and, and how it goes uh, and, and impactors within that. So I'll link the show notes and link your website, your Twitter, which is a, a treasure trove of information, but where else, where would you like to send my listeners? Where can they find out about uh, well, you can find yeah, out, yeah. you know, my daily uh, brain dump and, and lots of charts uh, is at A.E. Berman 12 on Twitter and artberman.com is my website. Um, there's a lot of free stuff on there. There's some subscription stuff also. But uh, between those two, uh, if you want to learn more, um, it's there. It's free. And, uh, you know, people I'll just leave with people saying, uh, you know, Art, the difference between you and me is that you're a pessimist and I'm an optimist. To which I say, hmm, um, I'm not either optimistic or pessimistic. I'm a scientist. I look at data. I look at information. As I get more information, my interpretation of it often changes. Hopefully, it always changes. But pessimism or optimism is just not part of the equation. I'm showing you data. Um, if you find any of my data is wrong, please let me know. I do make mistakes. But I think that. You've seen enough to understand that that what I'm telling you is not based on my opinion. It's based on data. It's based on information. And therefore, it's neutral. It's neither positive or negative. What you do with it can be very positive or negative. But it is what it is. 
I'm not a pessimist. <laughs> All right. I wish That's I could give you a happy. Yeah. A happy yeah. Well, that just ignore thought. all of the data and, uh, you, you know, go along living your, your, your life and you'll be show you the fine. part that looks good. Right. That'd yeah. be, that yeah, wouldn't exactly. be fair. That wouldn't be. Right. No, it's not. It's not. All right. uh, appreciate as always. Art, great to see you and uh, appreciate the update. OK, thanks, Ben. Always a pleasure. There you go. First off, thank you very much for listening all the way through. I hope you got a lot of value out of that conversation. As always, you can find show notes, links, and more at altassetallocation.com. Please share this with anyone you think might be interested and derive any value from this conversation. And as always, you can reach out to me for any feedback or questions. Please give the video a like or even better subscribe on YouTube or your podcast player of choice. This really helps others find the podcast or the video as well. Thanks a lot. Hope everybody has a fantastic day and stay safe out there and invest wisely. Cheers.